Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Needless to say, Reverend King was a visionary and a dreamer. He articulated a view of society that was distinctly different and imaginative way back in the 60s. While political equality, the ability to participate as a full member of society and in a participative, representative democracy was his primary aim which he accomplished, his second goal sadly is often forgotten. In his final years, he was actively focused on poverty. He was building a coalition, Indian tribes, coal miners, poor blacks, and planning a poverty march in Washington. Unfortunately, this was not to be. We know that representative democracy is not a guarantee of poverty reduction or poverty alleviation. Katrina once more showed us the face of poverty in this country. But poverty exists around the world. It is poverty that we must fight. Poverty is the silence that we must break. So this is my topic for today. And I'm going to talk today about a point of view on how to democratize commerce not just democratize the political process, but how to democratize commerce so every human being has an equal chance to participate in the benefits of globalization. If 20th century was focused on political freedom, from colonialism, communism, racism, to representative democracy, and it's still work in process, and we all know it's not done, but the wheels are in motion and the trend cannot be reversed. Therefore, it is time for us to think about what is next. So I believe that the 21st century will all be about economic freedom. We must focus on how to democratize commerce. That means we have to start with a very simple premise, exactly the simple premise that Dr. King started his civil rights with. It was not a complex premise at all. It was very simple and very telling. To me, the simple premise is every person in the world, not just in the United States, every person in the world to have access to the benefits of the global economy. Now, what does it mean in an operational sense? It means that every person must be first treated as a consumer. For those of you from the business school, and I can see a lot of faces in the business school, most companies focus on the top one billion people. Five billion people around the world, or 80% of humanity, has been below the radar screen. So when I say every person is a consumer, how do we start treating poor, not as wards of state, not as people who have to be taken care of by civil society, but legitimately as a consumer. I use the word consumer because not that I think consumption is the only way to get the benefits of global economy, but consumers always get respect and they have choice. So respect, dignity, and choice are the organizing idea behind treating everybody as a consumer. That means we have to make sure everybody in the world can afford world-class products and services. Not a light version, not a downgraded version of what you and I have, but exactly the same, but at prices that they can afford. And number two, and that it applies to all of us, including us here, that we need to have the ability to shape our own experiences rather than be shaped 
by large companies. What do I mean? Inst of an institutional view of the individual, I would like to suggest we have to move to an individual-centric view of large institutions, be it government or be it the large global company. So that is just using every person as a consumer, treating everybody as a consumer. But that is not enough. Everybody should have the right to access global markets and be treated fairly as a producer, provided fair wages for their skills, for their knowledge, and their effort. So how do we convert six billion people, five billion of them are not part of the global economy, to become both consumers, therefore they can afford consumption of the same goods and services, the same quality that you and I have, and at the same time, get fairness in the way they get treated as producers of product and services. This may appear to be a very utopian dream. I'm afraid it is not. The building blocks that are required to make this dream a reality is already taking shape around the world. And what I want to illustrate with some examples is that this is not a dream too far out. It is easy for us to make it happen in your lifetime, if not in mine, if you are determined to do it. The first thing that we have to do then is to include five billion poor in the market economy, both as consumers and producers. That means the bottom of the pyramid must be treated as a market with the disciplines of the market economy. The market economy is not unfair. It is very fair because it is transparent. We have to make sure that the markets work. Whenever you have distortions, it is because the market does not work and somebody is distorting the market economy. So my own work, which is called the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, was looking at how to create an inclusive capitalism and includes five billion people. There is an other side. Consumers must be able to shape their own experiences. If you look at what is happening today, the consumers are not equally powerful compared to the large company. The question is, how do you shape a world where consumers are equally influential? And those of you who are young here and who spend some of your time playing video games know that without consumers and consumer communities, there is no video game market. The question is, why can't we have the same influence in everything we buy? Therefore, we have the ability to shape our own experiences. And how do we co-create value use consumers as joint problem solvers, not as passive recipients of what the large company produces. And that is the substance of the other book that I wrote two years ago, co-wrote with uh, Venkat Ramaswamy called The Future of Competition. So the world is very clearly divided. I just take India as a case in point because I'm very familiar with it, but we have done the same pyramid for the world, for China, for Brazil, it, the shape is the same. Some of them are more skewed than others. There are about 50, 60 million people who can live reasonably well out of one billion people in India. The same thing is true. Maybe 150 million people in China out of 1.2 billion. And in the United States, 45 million people are either unbanked or underbanked. And that is a very bad and poor statistic to have in this country. So 20% of the people are in what I would call the bottom of the pyramid. The interesting thing is civil society and government have taken responsibility to deal with tier three, four, and five. Most large companies have really focused on tier one and two, some of them moving to tier three. And that is what we have to break. There is a common agreement with civil society and the large companies. There's only one issue on which there is agreement. And that is, this is how we divide the world. Unless we break this, we are not going to change the way the world is. Now, what is the problem? I believe the poor have unfortunately become a contested ideological market. I want to state it again the poor have become a contested market and its ideology. 
what is the ideology? Public sector, aid agencies, multilaterals like the United Nations and the World Bank want to create universal solutions. Imagine a universal solution that spans five billion people in 190 countries. There is no way. But that's what they like, because you can centrally manage it. On the other hand, if you go to philanthropy, which is quite significant, each one have a personal agenda. And personal agendas have, may or may not reflect the realities of the needs of people who want to pull themselves out of poverty. The civil society organizations, which do incredibly good work, are focused on social justice, primarily focused on social justice. And without economic justice, there is unlikely to have social justice. So each one have been fighting with each other, sometimes collaborating, but defending their ideological positions. And meanwhile, the poor woman with two buffaloes is caught without recourse to getting out of the trap. So what I'm suggesting, and I'm going to suggest, is this problem is only going to be solved if large firms, multinational companies get into the act. They have not been part of it for the last 50 years. They're just starting to get into the act. And all four groups collectively join their hands together and start shaping a new world where social justice and economic development can go hand in hand. They need not be at odds with each other. So all that I want you to do for me this afternoon is just make one simple mental leap. Instead of thinking about poor as an intractable problem, that they are just the concern of government and NGOs, not the concern of business, just make a mental leap that business is an instrument for poverty alleviation, and market perspective can provide the wherewithal for making this happen. So if you think of the bottom of the pyramid or the poor as a new market opportunity, as a new market, as consumers and producers who can participate effectively in the global market, then you cannot do this without significant innovation. And I'm going to share with you what kind of innovation is possible. And then, when you start making those innovations work in real time, in places where poverty exists, pockets of poverty exist, then you find there are new forms of governance that is required where the roles of the NGO, the roles of the multinational merge together and you create fundamentally new forms of organization that are capable of making this happen. So let me start with this picture. What do you see here? What do you see here? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Two elephants ambling along in the forest. Anything unusual? Yeah, people with rifles, this is, if you're in Thailand or in Burma or India, this is common. What I want you to see is there are two realities. One reality is the elephant. Ambling along in the forest, for 2,000 years that has not changed. Instead of bows and arrows, you probably now have a rifle. That's one reality. The other reality is what they're carrying on top of the elephant is electronic polling booths. Last election in India, 450 million people went to the polling booth and the entire election was electronic. 1.5 million electronic polling booths were deployed throughout the country. Now, the incumbents lost, and they complained about the results, but they did not complain about the process. Now, what I want you to think about, there is a second reality. The first reality is the elephant, that is poverty. The second reality is poverty as the basis. If you start looking at dealing with the problems of poverty, we can leapfrog our technologies. We still do not have electronic polling in this country. Maybe that's not a bad idea to have it. We did not have it in Germany, which went to election. We did not have it in Japan, which went to election. So what I want you to think about is poverty can give us the tools to leapfrog fundamentally 
into new technologies and new ways of doing things. There are two obvious realities. One is easy for everybody to see, another is not so easy. Elephants everybody can see, electronic polling booths everybody cannot. And that is what I want you to see for the next half an hour. So what is, based on my work, it's very clear that five million, five, five billion or 500 million people need help, not one or two. And it's very consistent with Reverend King's view that you cannot solve the problem in one island called the United States. You have to solve the problem around the world. That is why later on in his life he became more of an internationalist and less focused only on the problems inside the country. And that's also surprised too many of his friends and why he was talking about internationalism as much as he did. What I believe is if you solve the problems of five billion people, we can have a different world. You don't have to do it one day, but over the next 20 years. But you need to have at least four minimum requirements. You cannot do this without innovative high-tech solutions. Don't give the poor old solutions. It will not work. I can tell you that right now, because I've done enough thinking, writing, research to know old solutions will not work. We must worry about sustainable development. Five billion people getting into the marketplace using detergents like we use, the world cannot sustain it. Therefore, we have to innovate on how to create sanitation and cleanliness without traditional detergents. We have to worry about the earth. Scale. This is not about dealing with the problems of 50,000 people in one small community. That is better than not doing it. So every time I'm in India or in China, somebody said, this is an interesting experiment, CK. We are doing it with 20,000 people. I congratulate them, and then I have to remind them this is a rounding error, given the nature of the problem. <laughs> you have to think of scale. Less than 50 million, less than 100 million does not help me. But we have to experiment, start small, scale fast. So scale is very important, and I'm going to basically argue fundamentally new price performance uh, levels, and I'll share with you what I mean by that how to get 1 50th, 100th of the cost in the United States, but at the same time, the same quality levels. And that, I think, is what we need to accomplish. So democratizing commerce, the first challenge is creating the capacity to consume. Now, I must say that every time I talk to a business school student, not any of them in Ross School of Business, I'm, I'm happy to say they've been brainwashed enough Anytime you talk to someone and then say, we have to think of five billion people as consumers, what is the first response? They live on less than $2 a day. How can they spend money? What should be our response? How to create the capacity to consume is our first job as managers. It is not to say somebody is poor, I cannot sell to them. That doesn't require MBA education. But you need an education to be able to imagine how to convert them into consumers by saying, how do I create the capacity to consume? One is easy payments. This goes back to single sewing machine. Single sewing machine used to cost $100. Poor people in the Midwest cannot afford $100 a month or $100 one time. So they created the monthly payment, $5 a month. Then all middle class can buy and the rest of it is history. It became the first global company. So the question is, we know how to do this. Access to credit, lower the cost, get to 150th the cost at which we deliver service. Create single serve. Instead of putting shampoo in a big bottle, which costs $10, why don't you give me in a single serve in a sachet for one wash for less than one cent? Why can't you only say, pay me per use, like a laundromat? Some of us still remember as graduate students. We use coin-operated laundromats. Why not a coin-operated PC? Why not pay per use cell phones? The fastest growing business, high-tech business, in the poor countries of the world, including sub-Saharan Africa, is cell phone use. It may surprise most of you, last year, in sub-Saharan Africa, they signed up more subscribers for cell phone use than in the United States, new customers. 
So it is exploding. Why? Because we made it easy for people to consume. And direct distribution. So what I like to do is to give you what we can do with the poorest people in the world, people from Brazil in living in Havelas. The approach, use of scale, use of most advanced technology in retailing, use of innovative credit rating systems, because these people don't have a regular job, they don't have a regular income. How do you do credit rating on people who don't have a bank account or who don't have a regular job? How to build trust with these people and how do you focus their aspiration? And in fact, somebody has built one of the largest retailers in uh, Brazil. It's called Casas Bahia. It is also one of the most profitable. And I'd like you to see for yourself. Sede em São Caetano do Sul, cidade com melhor IDH e índice de desenvolvimento humano do país, segundo a ONU. A rede possui mais de 330 lojas em oito estados e uma carteira de 10 milhões de clientes. Com um atendimento diferenciado, facilidades e muita simpatia, as Casas Bahia se orgulham de ser uma das primeiras a implementar a venda pelo crediário no país, atendendo a uma necessidade dos consumidores das classes populares, seu público preferencial. Tendo como objetivo investir em benefícios e facilidades para os seus consumidores, as Casas Bahia desenvolveram uma política de concessão de crédito acessível à população de baixa renda. O crediário hoje é responsável por 90% das vendas. Somente no ano de 2002 foram feitos mais de 9 milhões de operações nesta modalidade. Financiamento eficiente e rápido é uma característica conquistada e mantida com o suporte de um software específico com o histórico dos clientes que foi desenvolvido internamente. As Casas Bahia confiam realmente em seus clientes, atendendo inclusive aos trabalhadores do mercado informal. E esta confiança é plenamente correspondida, pois o índice de inadimplência é um dos menores do mercado brasileiro. Eu comprei para ela um, um, uma pia com gabinete, uma máquina de lavar e dei presente de surpresa que era para ela. Eu falei, ó, oh, me entregue essas coisas, eu quero que você me entregue hoje. Ó, oh, ficou feliz, maior do mundo. Foi o presente maior que eu comprei para ela, foi isso aí. É por isso que eu não saio das Casas Bahia, não saio mesmo. Eu queria comprar esse jogo de cozinha, só que na época o meu salário não dava e não combatia. E eu sou faxineira e quem trabalha por conta, nas outras lojas não compra. Claudete, o que, que você não faz um crediário nas Casas Bahia? Foi uma alegria da minha vida. Quando eu peguei, né, eu cheguei lá e fiz a ficha, aí ele foi, falou né, que eu podia... And this is the most advanced back-end system in the world in retailing. And at the same time, they only work with the poorest people. And 10 million customers, three and a half billion dollars in sales, extremely profitable. But the important thing is 10 million customers. And I think this idea of uh, retailing is spreading across, not just here, but in other places as well. So part of it is making things available and accessible. Part of it is also reducing the price. So I thought I'll take another example called prosthetics for the poor. If you think about prosthetics, especially below the knee prosthetics or artificial limb, it is very hard to make, and especially all of them have to be custom fitted. And in India it is even worse because part of it is barefoot walking Part of it, you have to squat on the floor in the house. There's not much furniture. Sitting cross-legged, walking on uneven ground. That's not a surprise to anybody who has ever been to India. There's a lot of uneven ground. Paucity of doctors. and need to custom fit in a day. You can't ask poor people to come for eight fittings. They cannot afford to. They have to come in the morning and get fitted in the evening and leave. And at the same time, as I said, the precondition is must be as good as uh, the prosthetic that's available in the United States. Now, I also believe that these specifications are even more onerous than what you need in the United States. You don't have to do barefoot walking, you don't have to sit on the ground, you don't have to be cross-legged, and things of that kind. I know at least I have one doctor here, is it not? How much does a prosthetic cost in, India, in the United States? Six to eight thousand dollars, something like that. So, how many Indians can afford six to eight thousand? He also comes from India, so 
Make, make a guess. Not too many people. Not poor people for sure. So what do we do? Give up? Because for those of you who are interested in technical stuff, which I'm happy to deal with, not as well as doctor scan, the foot is a very complex uh, mechanical instrument. And I can give you, if you want squatting, what is the functionality that is required? When the doctor says, there's only one I can know, I figured out, but maybe there are others here. So we don't have to worry about all the technical requirements, but from a business requirement, for making it work, you need poverty, lack of trained manpower, de-skilling of the technical job, and time for fitting. I will show you what they have done, and then you tell me how much you pay for it. And then I'll also tell you how much they charge. The process is fast and simple, though largely manual. Foot and ankle assembly is made of vulcanized rubber compounds. Individual components are painted with rubber cement. Various toe and foot pieces are assembled together into one unit. Aluminium die is used to cast a normal foot shape. Sole shape patterns are placed on nylon cords used for reinforcement. This unit is then covered with skin-colored cosmetic rubber. Dye is tightened and placed in vulcanizer. After 20 minutes, foot is removed and is ready for use. How much would you pay? Six to eight thousand dollars in the United States, it's less than twenty dollars. This is what is possible if you put our mind to it. The starting point is not the technical details of the prosthetic. The starting point is how to serve the poor. And funnily enough, this has created world-class capability in what we can do. Fundamental innovation in how to do it. This looks like a very simple operation, but they need to understand the function of the foot as well as we do here and convert that into very simple technology that can be deployed, totally de-skilled paramedics rather than doctors. Now, this is not the only thing that is happening. 200x advantage in Jaipur foot, 16,000 per year. It is the largest facility in the world for prosthetics. Arvind Eye Hospital does cataract for $30 rather than $3,000. They, last year, they did 225,000 cataract surgeries. It's the world's largest. The next biggest is probably about 20,000. Cardiac care, you can get done in India, world class, with better mortality rates or lower mortality rates for $1,500 to $2,000 compared to $100,000 here. I want you to give it some thought. We can create a 1 to 50, 1 to 100 advantage if we pay attention to the bottom of the pyramid and we pay attention to innovation as a way to solve rather than subsidies and handouts. They can afford to pay $30. They can afford to pay $20. They cannot afford to pay $10,000. But this is better stuff and better quality it doesn't have all the finesse, it doesn't have an air-conditioned office, but it works. So part of it is how to create the consumption opportunity. The second is how to get good wages for people who work so hard. How do you get access to markets at fair prices? How to get access to national and global markets from the village? How to get access to information? Therefore, we eliminate the asymmetry in information between the poor and the rich how to build logistics, how to help improve quality, and how to help poor people enforce contracts 
as easily as the rich can enforce contracts on the poor. So I am going to talk about an opportunity to do this. These are subsistence farmers who work with less than two acres of land in the central part of India called Madhya Pradesh. A global company called ITC developed what they call electronic meeting place, and they essentially started this to buy soybeans. They gave one PC per village. It got connected to the internet. They picked one farmer in the village as the custodian, or what they call Sanchalak. The farmers had access to prices. They can check on the internet what the prices are, and then they could contract with the company to sell when they wanted to sell. And today there are more than a million farmers who are covered by this and it's growing extremely rapidly. Now it is moving to wheat, to shrimp, to a wide variety of crops, and this is becoming also a two-way chain. Not only you buy from farmers, you sell good seeds, good fertilizers, insurance, crop insurance, rain insurance, wide variety of uh, services. But listen to the guys who have never seen a typewriter in their life, probably went to third or fourth or fifth grade. What happens to them three months after? The day a computer engineer came here, we didn't even have to use this mouse. We didn't even know that our computer could be able to do some work in Hindi. In a good way, I have to do three months in a good way. If you stop the chop, I think that we have to buy our own PC and buy our own net connectivity. I have to see the maximum time of the C-Bot report. एग्रीवाच का या कुछ किसान वाच ये शिकागो बोर्ड ऑफ ट्रेड जो है डेली डेली देखने से उसको उसका एक आइडिया मालूम पड़ता है फ्यूचर ट्रेंड क्या हो सकता है मार्केट का और उस हिसाब से मैंने यहाँ के किसानों को सजेशन भी दिए हैं और उससे बेनिफिट भी मिला है ये किसान है ये अपना माल एक हजार में बेचने के लिए तैयार थे इनको रोक दिया हमने कि ये अभी माल अभी बेचना नहीं है अपने को वही माल इनका तेरह सौ रुपये में बेचा कुछ दिनों बाद ही मैंने पीपल रवा में कम से कम दस लाख रुपए का बेनिफिट करवाया है केवल सजेशन दे के अरे अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर की बात करता खासकर हमारे यहाँ का बेटा हुआ हाँ मैं शिकागो में ये भाव देखा हमने चौपाल पे भैया मुझे सोयाबीन इतना तेज हो रहा है हम तो आज नहीं बेचा चार दिन बाद बेचा Here is a subsistence farmer who is three months later accessing Chicago Board of Trade and of course we didn't know why he was doing it so we asked him we in the sense the two guys who wrote the case. His response was more interesting. He said, you are the educated one, you should know. <laughs> and of course, we did not know. Of course, we did some more research. It was very simple. Most of the soybean from India is exported. And the export prices are totally determined by the Chicago Board of Trade. And these guys figured this out. Now, I like to pose a simple question. What is wrong with poor people? These are not, this, is, this program has been so successful, the company is committing a billion dollars to expand the scheme because they find it extremely good for them. They can talk to the farmers direct. They can eliminate the middleman. The only guy who was upset was the middleman who used to make all the money. So you can create systems where poverty is partly a result of a symmetry of information and a symmetry of choice. If we can eliminate those two, then you create the asymmetry of capacity to enforce contracts goes away. These people can decide when to sell. They have a paper trail. They can enforce contracts. And of course, asymmetry of dignity and self-esteem, which was the real favorite topic of Reverend King, how to change the self-esteem and the dignity of poor people. That, I think, can be accomplished by doing exactly this as an example of how to do it. So there is a third challenge. If you want to democratize commerce, I said you have to also help people to determine what solutions they want and how they want it, rather than somebody imposing them from outside. So it is consumers' ability to shape their own experiences, locally relevant solutions, but global standards. We want global standards and local relevance and local customization, and of course, affordable pricing and easy access. Now, all of them look extremely hard to do. Let me show you another. It's a microcredit case, micro-saving on microcredit, 
from a company called ICICI Bank. They've created self-help groups, 20 to a team in a village, leadership training, saving, learning, contracting. The default rate is less than 1%. I wish our credit card companies could say about our college students that their default rate is less than 1%. And this is scaling up to 20, 25 million in the next five years. So this is a huge experiment not an isolated, small experiment in one small part of the country. In thousands of villages, like this one across the state of Tamil Nadu, a rural, drought-sensitive sector of southern India, over 150,000 women meet twice a month to discuss the financial future of their families and the villages. You know, these have been cases where the ladies were not even stepping out of their houses. But today they have the confidence of not only sitting in groups, but actually debating on some of the social and economic issues of the village. I think one thing that happens in fact with ladies is that when a lady develops, actually it contributes to development of four people, you know, because uh, you know, she doesn't think only of herself. If, if anything good happens to her, I think that good gets shared with the husband, with the children. So by touching one life, you're touching at least four lives or five lives. Here is 2.5 million families. It's one company. If, what if you replicate it 100 times around the world? And once you go and see these, your life is so touched and changed, you can't go back to normal work. At least there is one person here who was involved. Is that true or not? Stand up. Don't feel shy. You cannot. He is now starting something like this in order to help a lot of people. And I think he wants to be rich as well. Is that right? This, both are compatible goals. Doing well and doing good are compatible goals. We should not think of it as contradictory goals. So. What I want you to see is, in self-help groups, you first create capacity in the community. They have to save, they have to meet regularly, they have to keep logs. Then they decide what projects, what priorities, whom. The money goes to the self-help groups, and they decide among themselves who will get money for what projects. That is as local as you can get. At the same time, the global company provides integrated scale, scope, and standards. This is a very important part. How do you get global standards with local responsiveness and locally relevant solutions to the community? And how do you empower the community? And how do you create human capital at the community level by teaching them conflict resolution, teaching them how to save, and so on? So if you look at what the key issues are, it's access, it is transparency, it's dialogue, and it's dealing with risks and benefits. And that, I think, is what all these cases talk about. So what have we learned over the years? We need to develop a new business model. The old model doesn't work. The importance of local responsiveness and global standards, which is obvious. The role of civil society in the business model development and implementation. And the emergence of new forms of access and influence. Not control, not ownership. So let's look at how the civil society and MNCs are transforming in these examples. If you look at the civil society organizations, they start with social activists, then they become social entrepreneurs, then they become collaborators in creating businesses at the bottom of the pyramid. Initially, all of them started as uh, social activists. How many of you have been social activists and still are? Great, great, because that's the only check and balance that we have. So if you take away civil society, I think we'll be in a much worse situation. So deep local knowledge and trust, that's what they have as social activists. 
integrated village development, local self-sufficiency, and local solutions tend to be the starting point for many of the work in rural parts of India or Brazil or South Africa. Then they find that money dries out, especially money from the governments and from philanthropy. Is that your experience or not? All of you are smiling. That's a knowing smile. So what do they learn? They have to build socially relevant businesses. They seek markets, local crafts, materials, how to build social entrepreneurship at the ground level. But they also learn the disciplines of raising money, learning about the markets. Just because you can make nice baskets, if nobody wants to buy them, there's nothing much you can do. So they start learning that markets do exist and function in a certain way. Now, I find, and in fact, I was in India just three days ago. I go and visit NGOs in the village. They are very sophisticated. They understand how to become an integral part of the market-based ecosystem, which I'll come back to it. They know how to collaborate with multinationals, how to keep them in check, and how to co-create. So there's been a transformation, not all across civil society, but in some parts of civil society. Same thing is happening in some global companies. Of course, they start with efficiency and focus on value creation, only top 20%. Then they get beaten up, and then they learn CSR, or corporate social responsibility. Focus on working with NGOs on specific activities. They're learning about each other. Hands-off approach, give the money, let them do their thing. Now they're saying, maybe the bottom of the pyramid is a market. Focus on innovation through collaboration with NGOs. So I believe traditional roles, this is the anti-globalization part, this is Porte Alegre versus Davos, World Economic Forum versus World Social Forum. That is the red part, adversarial relationship. I believe we are moving towards a more collaboration-oriented, symbiotic relationship that is healthy, that keeps both in check, that is more oriented towards solving the problems of poverty and poverty alleviation. So what I see is from adversarial relationship to recognition of each other, low risk interactions called CSR, to letting each other into one's core businesses, time and task-based linkages, to developing a lasting co-creation relationship. We are not in phase three yet, but that is where I believe advanced companies and advanced civil society organizations are going, including Oxfam. So what is the transformation that is required? We have to go from thinking of poor as a problem to poor as an opportunity. Poor as wards of state to an active market. Old technologies to fundamentally new technologies. Don't follow the Western development, leapfrog. And I believe we are not constrained by resources, we are constrained by our imagination. So I believe that equity and development are compatible, and I believe equity is hardly ever defined. We all talk about how to measure economic development, but not social justice, and how to measure equity. I believe at least, I think of four measures of equity. There is opportunity to participate in the benefits of globalization for all people. That means it must be inclusive. Ability for all to participate in shaping their destiny. That means it must be co-created, not thrust upon them. Fair and transparent rewards, that means it must become a meritocracy, not based on gender, not based on race, not based on language. Ability for all to protect, use, and grow their wealth, that means we must start respecting property rights. So four issues, inclusion, co-creation, meritocracy, and property rights. There is also recognition that emerging convergence of the efforts of civil society consumer communities and the private sector. We have to create smart money because I find it increasingly interesting that when you go to venture capitalists, when you go to Sand Hill Road in California, in San Francisco, somehow $100 from Uncle Joe is not the same as $100 from venture capitalists because the venture capitalist brings accountability networks and so on. So the interesting question for me is what is the equivalent of smart money in developmental effort and poverty alleviation. 
And I believe that we need to create market-based ecosystems. Extra legal work will always, people outside the legal system will always exist. Micro enterprises, one or two person operations, small cooperatives, large local firms and multinationals and NGOs. And we need to really rethink the role of women in economic development. There is a lot of discussion about gender neutrality. I believe if you think about economic development at the bottom of the pyramid, gender neutrality may be the official statement. Gender bias towards women is probably better because every case that you find of successful work at the bottom of the pyramid, economic development and social justice, the role of women have been very, very central. You cannot ignore it. That is Grameen Bank in Bangladesh to self-help groups in India to self-help groups in Brazil, everywhere. So it raises big questions for us as academics, as managers, can economic development and equity coexist? My sense is yes. Can one solution fit the problem of five billion poor? No. Should have preferences for one solution? Obviously not. Is the source of funding as important as the level of funding? Yes. Are the poor inherently entrepreneurial? You bet. You saw the examples. What is the primary focus in social entrepreneurship? Is it social or entrepreneurship? I believe entrepreneurship is a big capital E and social is small s. The reason is if you create entrepreneurship, the social collateral will necessarily follow. If you focus on social collateral, entrepreneurial development may or may not follow. It may, but it may not. What are the gender roles? Don't ignore women. Give them a central place. Should public investment focus on building private sector solutions? At least for me, the answer is yes. But these are questions that are unresolved, researchable, and we must continue to debate them. I say this transformation requires not intellect, not money. It requires imagination. We have to reinterpret what Reverend King said 40 years ago. We have to dream. We have to imagine a world that is different. If we cannot imagine that world, we cannot create it. He imagined a world and he created that world. And I think we have to reinterpret his dream on what justice is. So let's imagine, let's have passion, let's have courage, lot of humanity, lot of humility. Some intellect helps. And I would take luck last. Fundamentally, the question for all of us as the most fortunate in the planet is a simple one. Do these children deserve our attention? If we can answer that simple question in our lives, I think the world would be a better place. And we would have given meaning to Reverend King's dream. Thank you very much. Can you give us an update on some of these things, how they've advanced, if they've kind of slipped back, or are they going forward, or is it a magnitude that they're going up, or are they slowly moving along? I believe that almost uh, 40, 50 percent of the Fortune 500 companies accept the idea fully. Now, that doesn't mean they're doing something about it, but they accept the idea. They're not fighting it. So if I went to large global companies today, and talk about the bottom of the pyramid, it's not news. Uh, the question is how do we do it? Where do we start? Uh, how much resources to put? So I think there has been a huge shift. Now, are we home free? Not by a long shot. But I think it has started a movement towards recognizing that poverty need not be a problem. It could be an opportunity and five billion people joining the global market may be the largest push that we ever could have received for globalization on the next wave of prosperity. So people recognize that there may be a huge 
latent wave of prosperity that we never saw before. So uh, I'm very pleased, even though I say it myself, uh, because when you put something out for the first time, you don't know whether it will be received well or you're going to get hammered. But uh, so far, it has been received very well. I do think while this concept can be globalized, that there are certainly cultural elements within each country that would undergird the dynamics at play. And I could have shown you some Mexican examples, so South African examples. Uh, but I don't have an American example. But if you think about 45 million poor Americans who need some kind of help, uh, not just uh, access to credit, not access to bank accounts, but affordable products, uh, affordable services, uh, there is a huge opportunity here. Take, for example, remittances. It's a huge problem. People are paying an extraordinarily high amount of money for remittances of money from the United States to Mexico or to South America. Every large bank understands this is a huge market. So they're all setting up shop where the poor people live. They're making branches accessible. They're making people who speak their language who, are, who you don't have to feel that you're approaching some strange person and you're not sure whether you'll be welcome. So all that is starting to happen. Now, is there a big effort to change things in the United States? Not that I know of. The comparative work is going to take some time because while there are pockets of great effort, uh, the benefits of comparing how microfinance works in India compared to Bangladesh, compared to South Africa and uh, Brazil and uh, in the United States is going to take some time. But I'm a great believer that if you look at multinational companies, they deal, every day they deal with cross-cultural effort and cross-cultural work. An IBM and a GE and a Motorola work cross-culturally every day. So they know how to sort out the universal from the specific. And I, am a great believer, since I spent 30 years of my life researching global companies, that if it works in one place, and if you deeply understand why it works, I can take the universal and transport it and recontextualize it for the local uh, economy and the local culture. So, uh, I'm a great believer that that work needs to be done, but we don't have to work, wait for the studies. We just have to take a leap from multinational companies and get on with it. I wasn't sure if you were suggesting that the way this was gonna come about was through lowering production costs of providing services or making the consumer goods. And if so, um, can you kind of detail on what types of um, things would be necessary to lower the production costs? Well, there is a whole bunch of things you have to do. It's just not lowering production costs. It is lowering the entire, changing the entire economics of the business. Production costs being one, distribution costs, developmental costs, all of them have to be changed. And uh, I detail 12 different ways to do it uh, in the book, but it's only start of the iceberg, uh, the tip of the iceberg. There are, as people are getting into these markets, they're discovering fundamentally new ways to change things. Uh, for example, ICICI works through self-help groups and local community banks. So their cost structure is not affected. The cost structure is extremely low for self-help groups. They do the distribution, they do the credit checking, they do the project monitoring, they do all the work that the bank used to do before. And they're quite happy to do it because they get access to low cost credit. So there are many, many ways to do it. And there's not a single way, but the key is to reduce it to 1 50th of American cost, or 100th. Therefore, we can afford to spread it around the world. Progress you've described could be somewhat threatening to local governments. How do you address the resistance that might be encountered by governmental entities? I think the local government, local money lenders, are all going to fear this because if these people are lifted out of poverty, they don't have a job. So that's not new. Uh, one of the things that we have to do is to find out how to morph their work into something more productive rather than just distributing checks. So we have to find a job for them and we have to invent a way that they have a role in society because they have a lot of local knowledge. 
So the goal is not to eliminate them. The role, goal is to eliminate the current work, and that's very different. So you want to eliminate the work that they're doing, give them new work, but it is still productive and it is material for the well-being of the community. What would happen if the prosthetic foot were introduced for $20 in this country? Wouldn't there be a lot of resistance, and how do you deal with that? Uh, you bet. There will be a lot more than resistance. Uh, they're first going to say it is not good quality. Even though I have compared the quality levels, uh, both in the United States and uh, in India, on 20 parameters, it's in the book. I have compared the same cataract surgery, both during and post-operative surgery complications, between what's happening in uh, England, uh, 18,000 patients, so it's not a small number, with 22,000 patients in this hospital. And this hospital is better on both during and post-operative care. I've also done the same thing for uh, cardiac care, especially pediatric cardiac care. So the data exists, but data will be fought because this is a different way of doing things. Uh, it changes the work patterns. It changes the underlying economics. It changes our beliefs about what is good practice. So it's not going to be easy to transfer these uh, to established systems. And the reason why none of them are desperate to come to the United States, they're going to other places. For example, Jaipur Fort is in 16 countries. And you go and ask them, why are you not in the United States? They say, why? There are people inviting us to come in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Iran, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Rwanda, all the usual suspects. We cannot do enough. We want to help them first. The United States can take care of itself. The reason is, if we come there, we'll spend all our managerial energy fighting the system. Now, will it happen sometime? You bet. Uh, it is new form of outsourcing. It is already happening in hip replacement surgery. People find it easier to go to India, take the first class, uh, any flight from out, take first class, go there, get your hip re replacement done, go and take a holiday in Goa and come back. It's a lot cheaper than doing it here. In India, we call it wellness tourism. <laughs> so you come, check out cardiac care, you go get your eye surgery, visit the temple in Madurai, make sure it's okay, and then come back. <laughs> so it's going to happen, but not easily. I don't imagine myself seeing this in Ann Arbor for a long time. If University of Michigan is going to be a global university, do we have an obligation, intellectual and moral obligation, to deal with these problems as part of our work? Not as a sideshow, but as an integral part of what we do in this university. Otherwise, calling ourselves a global university will not ring true for me. Thank you very much. <laughs>